gets your head nod, Children's Church, head that way, and we'll get going on the message. I'm <laughs> thankful for, uh, yeah, grace and mercy and favor, and um, a lot of things end, and they disappear, but those things don't for us as believers. <clears throat> so today, we're in our series, as uh, Megan said, a series where we've been dealing with some heavy things, and... Um, <clears throat> It's been, uh, it's been really helpful for, to me in the months that kind of led up to this, uh, working through a lot of these topics and ideas and um, things that we all face, maybe not on a daily basis, but certainly on a life basis. And um, my hope is that as we look at these individuals, these characters throughout the scriptures, uh, we'll begin to see that um, it's okay to not be okay. We just don't stay there. And certainly we should talk with someone as well, uh, whatever issue you might be facing today. And so today we'll be talking about despair, uh, another one of those heavier topics. But we'll be cut, uh, starting in 1 Kings chapter 18, so you go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one uh, in front of you in the chair rack. And if you don't have a Bible at all, then that's um, certainly your Bible to take home today, if you'd like one. And I didn't mention it, but my name is Michael. I'm the pastor here. Uh, everybody here in person, I think, knows that. And if you're listening online, though, um, then it's, uh, it's good for you to be here. Glad that you're here. I'd love to see you in person. Uh, also, and um, before we jump into the message, just a, a congratulations to David and Rachel on the baby uh, coming. So we're excited about that, and then all the joys and what things that uh, that will bring in life for you. And so we're in First Kings eighteen, and before we jump into this, I want to just talk to you a little bit about the, um, the mountaintop and the base. Uh, maybe you've never been on a mountain before. You're afraid of heights. That's okay. Uh, but we all face these uh, ebbs and flows of life. I was thinking about the song this week uh, by Torrin Wells, uh, The Hills and Valleys. And there's certainly a lot of those in life. They don't seem to stop until we get to the end. And uh, maybe you're on a, a hill right now, maybe you're on a mountaintop, or maybe you're, uh, you've are you come off of that hill and you're at the base and you're just trying to figure out what is the next step? What's the next step? And, and maybe you don't know what that is. And I hope today that as we look at this account of what takes place and one of the prophet of God's life, uh, we'll see that, um, that, man, it's okay for anybody to not be okay. But he didn't stay there, and he did that with the help of the Lord. And so maybe you don't know the Old Testament quite as well, the book of First and Second Kings, it's in a series of books that really address the, the, uh, the rise and the decline of God's people, of Israel. And, and so this, this really kind of accounts more, this series, First and Second Kings, of the, the life of the kings that come after David and Solomon. So you've got a good start for God's people. Uh, they had King Saul, who kind of started well, but then ended badly. And you got King David, a man after God's own heart. And King Solomon, who uh, we talked about today, Bryce did in Proverbs chapter 1, who, who wrote most of the book of Proverbs and gave us a lot of our wisdom literature. And so Solomon was the wisest man to ever ever live. We got David after God's heart. We got Solomon, a man who was wiser than anyone else. And now we get to this place in Israel's history where they've, they've departed from God. Uh, we've seen this throughout the scriptures, the ebbs and flows of life and of choosing to follow God or not. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, we come to a king who's in charge, King Ahab. He's, he's not really a good king. Uh, he, to some degree, um, fears the Lord, uh, fears his prophets, and, and allows Elijah to do some work here. And we'll see this on Mount Carmel when he confronts prophets of Baal and God's power is uh, made manifest. And, and maybe you grew up in church and you've heard this story a thousand times. Uh, at times I think I shy away from these type of stories because we're like, oh yeah, we know that one. But, but oftentimes we read the height of the story. You know, we read the mountaintop of the story. We don't keep reading to see what happens afterwards. Because it's these giants of the faith, these individuals, these fathers of our faith who are in the scriptures that encounter just as many difficulties as us or more. And we'll see that uh, Elijah came to a place where he, he despaired for a moment and needed God's help to get back on track. And so that's what we'll be taking a look at today. And as I was getting ready for this, I was thinking about mountaintops, and, I, and I've been on many. Um, maybe you've been on more. That's okay. Uh, but I love mountaintops. I know there's something about it. If you were, you know, Some people like the beach. That's my wife. <laughs> and uh, some people like uh, being on the top of a mountain. And then that's me. People ask me, where would you like to go on vacation? I would rather be on the top of a mountain, right? I don't know, something about getting cooked in the sand, you know, do all that. that that's not my thing. But, but being in the snow, uh, being on the top of a mountain uh, is where I like to be. And so 
Um, this really started for me growing up. My grandparents started this tradition of going to uh, a ski resort, which here, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal because you can get in your car and you can drive about 45 minutes to an hour and you can, you can find a few. Uh, but for me growing up in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, the closest place you could go was in New Mexico and you, it was about 750 miles. And uh, yeah, it was a whole day trip just to get there and you get there and uh, we, they started this tradition before I was even born. So yeah, like I went there uh, in the womb also. And so I, I remember going there as a kid though and learning how to ski, you know, like two or three years old. Uh, and I just loved it. And so I lived for that moment where, you know, you get there and you get your skis on and you get on the lift and, uh, you know, you get all the way to the very top of the mountain and you get off and you're just like, wow, you know, look at, look at what God has done. And I think for me as a young man too, I anticipated the, after the standing there for a moment, going as fast as I could, you know, down the slope. Uh, and uh, I know some of our, um, Young men in the room like to do that. In fact, Eli's smiling because I went on a trip with him a few years ago. <laughs> we went up to a ski slope, and um, uh, I, I thought, you know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm 32 then. I was 32 last time I went with you guys, and uh, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'm pretty, I'm still pretty, you know, I'm in good shape, right? I can go and ski with the teams, and so I did that, and I didn't doubt that until I got to this point where like, okay, we're gonna go off the trail, we're gonna go into the trees. I'm like, oh yeah, it sounds fun. Until it's not, <laughs> and you're like, I don't think I function quite like I used to. You know, as a teen, you're just like banging your knees like on the ice in between and just trying not to hit a tree. And then you're like, if I hit a tree, I think I'm going to recover a lot less, you know, a lot slower um, than these guys if they do. So I did that a few times. I was like, you know what, guys, I think I'm going to go ski with the adults for <laughs> a little bit again. And then I realized like where I was in life. I was like, I'm not a teen. I'm not in my 20s. I'm a little bit, you know, further along in there. And so I got to make some more wise decisions like Solomon would say. But you know, I look forward to all these moments, and I love doing stuff like that. But what, what happens at the end of the day, right? What happens when you come to the end of the trip, and you get down off the mountain, and you find yourself at the base? Like, oh, the trip's over. I remember the, um, the very last run of the day, I would time it perfectly. So I would get on the lift, you know, one of the very last lifts would go all the way to the top. And of course, people were waiting for me. But you know, I got all the way to the top, and then I waited until the lift stopped, and how you know, most of the people had gone down. And, you know, just took it in. It's like that last moment on the mountaintop. And then I went as fast as I could, you know, all the way down. And I remember going all the way in the intermediate hill and the bunny hill. And sometimes there was enough snow you could ski all the way out to your car. And I remember stopping there and getting my stuff off and, you know, putting it in the, in the car. And there's that moment. It's like, maybe as a teen, this is about as much despair as you can be in at, the, at that time. But uh, I remember driving away. And there's just that moment that hits you. You know, you're at the base. You're driving away. And you won't get to come back to that place for at least another year, maybe longer. That was my reality. You drove all the way back, and you're like, man, this is depressing. You know, I'm not going to be back in this place again. And I think many of us, if not all of us in the room, have felt like that at some point, right? Whether it's a vacation you were looking forward to, and you're coming home, and you're like, I don't want to come home. I don't want to go back to work. I don't want to, you know, encounter all the things that regular life entails, which are not always exciting. It's not always the mountaintop. It's the day-to-day, -day, right? things that feel like drudgery at times. But God reminded me when I was going through this text that it's okay. Right? The mountaintops are there to remind us of God's goodness and his faithfulness, all the things that we carry with us and he never forgets and never ends. And in Elijah's story, he encounters some similar things for us that I think will help us today. So the first one on the blank, Elijah is bold. Elijah is bold. And so Elijah calls out injustice to the king. Now, there were a lot of prophets that were in the Old Testament. And, and as you read through this, by the way, we're not going to hit every verse. I normally do that. But I, I wanted us to see what the point and the, the context and the focus of this moment of despair for Elijah was. So, again, not every verse today. It's not what we normally do. Uh, kind of think of um, being in an airplane. We're going to take more of a 30,000-foot look at the text. And so Elijah's bold. Um, this, this is not all the prophets of Israel throughout history. Some of them were not good ones. Some of them were... Uh, were really bad ones. Some of them, they did their job, but the kings didn't like them, and so the, their uh, ability to be a prophet did not last very long. Uh, they, they were in the position, and they did what God told them to do, but then the king was like, I don't like it when people tell me that I'm doing the wrong thing, so now you die. <laughs> but for Ahab, he wasn't a good king because he had Jezebel as a wife, so if that tells you anything, then uh, that probably helps you, gives you some context there. Uh, but, but Ahab does one thing. He does, to a degree, fear the Lord's prophet is anointed. And so we'll see what takes place here. It gives Elijah the opportunity to set the record straight 
and then to have this mountaintop experience, literally a mountaintop experience on Mount Carmel where uh, God conquers the prophets of Baal. So let's take a look at it. First Kings 18, we'll read verses 17 and 19 just to start off with. It says, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house because you've abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals and therefore send and gather all Israel to be to me at Mount Carmel, all 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah to eat at Jezebel's table. So there's this interesting account that takes place. Elijah comes to the king, and as soon as the king sees him, he's like, you, you troubler of Israel. Is it you? Are you here to make my life miserable? What the king didn't understand was that he was making his own life miserable. So this word here for troubler, it's what the king says first here, and then Elijah turns it back on him. This word, akar, in the Hebrew, someone who brings calamity. The king who was operating in wickedness said to Elijah, Is it you, you troubler? You've brought trouble to this place again. And then Elijah reminds him who has really brought trouble to the house. He says, You're the troublemaker. You've caused more issues, more strife. And Elijah responds here. He says, You brought this down on yourself, you and your family. What did he say that they had done? He said, And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house because you abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baal. So he sets the record straight, and notice um, Ahab, he, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't, he's like, no, you're wrong, actually. He's like, uh, <laughs> I think you guys are just right about that. We kind of did do that. So he doesn't say anything else, and then Elijah kind of lays down the gauntlet. He's like, okay. He's like, I'm not the troubler, but you are. But here's what you're going to do. We're going we're gonna, to, God set, set this time aside. We're going to settle this thing once and for all. Who's really God? Let's go find out. And he says, get all the prophets. He's telling them what to do, right? So a prophet of God, is he's telling a king of Israel what to do. And this was pretty uncommon, too, because, again, in these situations, there was a degree of respect, but, but things had gotten so bad. Like, God had commissioned Elijah just to go. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited about it. And God had commissioned Elijah to go and to say, hey, it, I'm done, right? It's time to end things. We're going to go to Mount Carmel, and we're going to set the record straight. Uh, Ephraim, uh, the Syrian, who was a church father, said, It's not my words that are good, but your actions which are disgusting and trouble Israel. And this freedom of speech torments Ahab greatly, that he doesn't fight back or rebuke Elijah about anything, as it relates to the two histories of kings. Why did he do this? Well, he says, So that you may know the authority that the Lord had given Elijah over the spirit of the king, and fear towards his prophets that he had put in Ahab's heart. So, not wise in a lot of areas, but he was wise enough not to contradict Elijah's words. He said, no, you're right. We, we, did. we have turned aside and gone wrong. He said, yeah, we'll send the prophets. We'll, we'll meet you up there. And here's a second fill in the blank. Elijah is used. So, have you ever found that when you've been uh, bold for the Lord, whenever you've been like, you know what, whatever you want me to do, God, we'll do that. And sometimes you find out what that is. You're like, wait a second. <laughs> I didn't really know that I want to do that. I know, I know I said that, but I'm not sure that I wanted to. Um, but Elijah stands his ground, right? And then he ends up getting used on Mount Carmel. I don't know if like all those guys were there and I was by myself and they're like, let's see who's going to set the altar on fire. Uh, I don't know that I would have had the confidence to do what Elijah did here, but uh, we see here in verses 20 through 40, that's exactly what he does. So uh, God uses Elijah and he flexes his muscles so that God's people will be reminded who God is. And so we'll jump down to verse 36. And I'll kind of summarize what takes place after we read the, uh, verse 36 through 39 before that. And it says, And at the time of the offering of oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, 
He is God, the Lord. He is God. And of course, you know from the account that none of the prophets of Baal escape. Uh, they are all taken out, and uh, God conquers them there. So this account of what takes place before, so Elijah, we see that we love the triumphal story, but everything that leads up to it, like Elijah's got full confidence. I don't know if you've ever walked into a situation like that. Maybe you're like, I'm good at my job. I'm confident. And I can go in you know, each day and I can, I can conquer whatever challenges I face. Well, Elijah was a prophet of prophets. He was confident in what he was doing because he knew that he had a God who was real backing him. In fact, uh, if, you, if you read the verses leading up to this 20 through 38, um, you, 20 through 35, you're going to see some things take place. And Elijah, as the prophets are going like, oh, Baal, would you bring down fire? And they kind of set like this perfect, you know, I don't know if you've uh, had one of those little you know, bonfires or campfires. You've been camping, um, and you're like a pro at making that. You, every time you're like, I set the match, I light it, whatever, it's going to go up immediately. Well, they've set this thing to light. And they're like, yeah, we couldn't do anything else wrong. And they're like, you know, Baal, please, you know, light the fire. And it gets to the point where they're like, they're like yeah, hurting themselves or cutting themselves. And uh, Elijah has some questions for them. And he, he's, he's really mocking them in the situation. It's kind of an interesting account. It's a serious one. But, you know, Elijah's going like, uh, is he asleep? Is, is Baal asleep? Like, uh, maybe he's tired. Uh, maybe something else is going on. And you read this in the text, but he's like, maybe he went to the bathroom. I don't know. I mean, like, I know people do that, right? It almost seems inappropriate in the moment, but, but Elijah's like, maybe maybe he's gone somewhere else. Maybe he's just busy. Maybe he's, <laughs> he's got something else going on, and, and he can't deal with this right now. And so they get to the point where they're like just exhausted and done everything they can, and Elijah comes up and he says, God, why don't you show everybody who you are? And, and if you read what Elijah does to set the blaze to, he's not like getting all this like dry tinder and like, okay, you know, if you need a little spark gets on it, like, you gotta set the fire for that. And he's like, it'll, it'll, it'll go off. And people are like, wow, your God is amazing. And just, uh, he didn't bring his lighter. He's like, oh, fire from heaven. Wow, that's so, that's so amazing. Wow, look at what God did. So the fire falls from heaven and he's prepared this thing. They're, they're like pouring water all over it. And, uh, and, and I don't know if you, maybe, maybe you're new to this, but. My experience with the fire service and all that side of thing, like water puts out fire. Water doesn't let you set something on fire. It's like covered it in water. You're never gonna set it on fire. And Elijah's like, I'm so confident in the Lord. I'm so confident that he's he can overpower the elements. And it's interesting these words here that he used. So God answers, of course, the fire comes down, and you're like, you know, this is one of the greatest stories in the Old Testament. It's amazing. It says here that the Burnt offering was consumed, the wood, the stones, the dust, the water was licked up in the trench that was beside it. So this word here for consume is akal in the Hebrew, and it means to entirely devour or destroy with nothing left. I don't know if you if you thought about how significant that is before, but I I, mean, I like you know science and studying things and doing like the background focus. And so I was like, what would it take to incinerate? stone you can't actually do that in, in this world at least right so so he sends this fire from heaven right that it's a different kind of fire if you think about it he, he incinerates everything even the stone and it's like i was looking up like how hot would it have to be immediately for the fire from heaven to consume the stone and i, I read this interesting article and it said that a rock cannot be burnt to ashes for one simple reason it's already ashes so scientifically he says this is to say a rock is usually some kind of oxidide, which is the end production or process of burning to ash. But God sends the fire from heaven, and he consumes everything. And it's like everything Elijah's been confident about. He's like, he like you know, God, hey, God did what he said. He took care of the prophets of Baal and the people. What do they do? They fall on their face. I mean, this is just like, this is one of the greatest accounts in the scripture of people being like, Wow, God is amazing. This really is serious. Okay, you know, he is the one true God. But what happens after the mountaintop for Elijah? We don't always read the rest of the story. I think sometimes it's because we're like, you know, yes, you know, well, win for God's team, you know, close the book. <laughs> we don't need to see the rest of it, okay, because what do we do? I mean, our culture does it now. I think, I think more, more, maybe worse now more than ever. Although I hear some more conversations about mental health and all that. People are starting to talk about it. But, but we like to read the Bible stories where we're like, hey, close it. It's uncomfortable to talk about, you know, 
people struggle or when they have difficulty or when they despair. I mean, God forbid anybody here to be like, I don't know what I'm going to do. What is the purpose of my life? And those are questions that we ask sometimes. And God's not afraid of that. He wasn't afraid of that when Elijah asked this question. So here's the third one. There's four today. We're making good time, though, right? We're making good time. <laughs> here's the third one. Elijah is scared. How could a guy who stood before the prophets of Baal, and they're all, they've set this perfect, you know, structure to go ablaze, and Elijah's so confident, he drenches it in water, and he prepares it, and the special fire from heaven comes, consumes everything, everything's confirmed for Elijah, and what happens? Well, we'll read verses 1 through 8 of chapter 19 that gives us this account. And so Elijah doubted God's plan and care for him, and this is really why he falters. So in verse 1 it says, Ahab told Jezebel, so he's gone back to the report to his wife, all, the, all Elijah had done, and uh, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. It's a nice way of saying it. We're, she's saying, we're going to kill you. And in verse 3, then he was afraid, and he rose, and he ran for his life, and he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, Is it enough now, O Lord? Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And maybe... You've never gotten to that point in your life. I hope not. But maybe there's been a point of despair for you. Maybe you're, you've come off of that mountaintop. Maybe you had like the job you wanted and everything was going great. You lost a job. Maybe you had a health crisis. Maybe you lost somebody close to you. And before you were in a place of just like, man, this is so amazing. I can't believe I've gotten this point in life. And, and God's been so amazing. But what does Elijah do? Prophets of Baal get conquered. He's used as this amazing vessel for God. He's confident. And then he walks off the mountain. And, and Jezebel gets word. And she says, yeah, we're going to kill you. He's got God on his side. And so if a guy like Elijah, one of the most, I think one of the most influential, amazing prophets in the Old Testament, <clears throat> who did great things for the Lord, can, can walk out into the wilderness and just be like, leave me alone. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm going to go sit down under a tree. I mean, how many, how many prophets, how many people who followed God like walked out into the wilderness by themselves and were like, I can't do this anymore? You ever felt like that before? That's okay. Like we've said before, we're in good company, and, and luckily the Lord didn't leave them there in, his, in this desperate situation, in his depression, in his despair, because he was bold. Elijah was, he was used. He got scared like many of us do at times when we come off of the mountain. But God's going to do something else. He's going to preserve him. So that's the last fill in the blank. Elijah is preserved. God's communication, his provision and purpose in Elijah's depression is made clear here in verses 9 through 18 of 1 Kings chapter 19. God reassures Elijah his purpose in his final missions. And these 7,000 people who didn't bow to me. Can you imagine saying to God, like, hey, I, I know I did this amazing thing for you, and now this, you know, crazy queen lady, she's after me, and, like, what am I supposed to do? So she's going to kill me, and she can actually follow through with that, all right? So Ahab's, like, he's kind of like the complacent king. He's like, okay, Elijah, I'm sorry. He's like, yeah, yeah, we'll get the prophets together. And then uh, and then uh, Jezebel's like, no, no, we're not doing that. Uh, he's going to die, okay? We're going to take care. Yeah, he took care of his business. Now we're going to take care of our business. And Elijah gets scared. But God's there. He's there to preserve him. He's like, well, all this stuff I've already already done with you. I've already used you. And, and we think at that moment, too, like, I just don't know what's left. I don't know what my purpose is. God comes alongside him in a gentle whisper, we'll see. We're always looking for, like, that, you know, we'll see there's going to be earthquakes and, like, fires and, like, mountains get, like, broken into. And uh, but God wasn't in any of those things. That's it. So this faint whisper, he communicates to Elijah, and he says, hey, I'm not done with you. You still got a purpose. In fact, you need to do some things so that you can pass the mantle off to somebody else, and I need you to do that. That's kind of part of the deal. So, starting in verse 9, it says, There he came to a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, 
I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I alone, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Elijah just loses a little bit of perspective, right? He goes off and he's like, it's really worse than it is. And God, I'm here. And I'm like, you know, I, he's not saying lies at the beginning. He just says, hey, I, God, I've done some things for you and you know how bad it is. I mean, they, they're killing the prophets. I, went, I did what you said. And, and now what? what's left? I mean, just to, you know, take my life. Is it, is it going to be taken from me? And in verse 11, he says, and he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Always, like, I would not want to be Elijah at that point. You know, I'm like, nobody's left, God. I mean, you left me here to die, basically. Is that what you, you know, just go ahead and take my life. And he's like, why don't you come out and meet me on the mountain? <laughs> Has God ever done that to you before? I'm, I'm like crying in the corner, please. I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to come out. Like, I'm good where I am. And so he calls him out. And it says here, and behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind tore the mountain and broke it into pieces and the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. I don't know if you've been in wind that bad, but like tearing up mountains, that seems like bad. I've seen some tornadoes growing up in Texas, but this seemed worse, all right? So he's, he's like, is he in that? No, he's, but he's making these things happen and showing him who he is. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. It's been a few little earthquakes, right? But nothing, I'm sure, like what he experienced, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12, and after the earthquake, a fire. The Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. Sometimes when we're in that place, we feel like we're looking for that. Like, you know, God, if you would show me a billboard, and it just tells me exactly what I need to do, or, you know, if you would, like, bring something in my life, who's going to be like, God told me to tell you this. And I'm not saying that can't happen, right? God can do that. He can use anything. But for Elijah, after he, 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 had, he had been used by God, and this miraculous thing had taken place, and then God starts breaking mountains in half, and he's like, there's fire and there's earthquakes. He's doing all these, you know, amazing things. But that's not how he spoke to Elijah. This little whisper, a low whisper is what the text says. And you fast forward down because they're going to go through this again. Elijah's going to give the account. And then God's going to tell him what he's going to do with the rest of his life. So after he gives him this little whisper, he goes, hey, here's what you're going to do. Here's why everything that you did is so important. You're going to anoint a couple more kings, right? Because they just... They keep messing things up, so we got to get some more guys in there. Uh, there are going to be some more kings you're going to anoint. That's what, what the, one of the jobs the prophets did. So he anoints the kings. He says, you're going to appoint another prophet who's going to come after you. Like, oh, you mean the story's coming to an end? Yeah, and you've got to finish the job. you got to finish the race. So don't think that it's over yet. Still has some things left for him to do. And then verse 18, he reminds him. He gives him a little perspective. Sometimes we just get in this place where we're like, we don't really perceive reality right, or we like, we beat ourselves up so badly. We're like, yeah, God, I know you did some amazing things, and you know, I was a part of that. But um, now, I mean, what what are you doing? I mean, what's the point? What's my purpose anymore? And he, he turns this assumption on Elijah's part that he's by himself, that he's alone. We feel like that too sometimes. And in verse 18, he says, Yet I will leave 7,000 of Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not Kissed him. God answers all of his questions, right? He, uh, he doubts him, and the one thing he says, he's like, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one that's here. God, I'm going to die either by Jezebel's hand or you know, you're just going to take my life. And he brings him to this place where he's like, no, you still have purpose. Because remember, Elijah was bold before. He got used by God. He got scared, and he ran away. And he sat under a tree, and he's like, God, this is it. This is it. I'm going to go ahead and take, take, take my life. And then what does God do? Well, he responds by preserving Elijah. And he says, hey, you may not have a whole lot longer, but you've got these things that I really need you to do. This is your purpose. This is your goal. This is the, the main point of your life. And then he even, he doesn't have to do this, right? Because God calls him out in the mountain, and he could have just been like, you know what? Get over yourself, right? Yeah, yeah I know it's hard, but, uh, but God still has still got some things for you to do. No, he calls him out in the mountain, and he demonstrates his power, and he speaks to him. Such a soft voice, right? In a low whisper after he's demonstrated everything else. And he says, here are these 7,000 people. You're not alone. You're never alone, Elijah. Maybe other people weren't standing up at that time, but your job is right here and right now. And even when you feel like, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, even when you feel like you're really in that place, like, God, there's nobody else. There's nobody else that's here. God's like, 
Look around. Look around, because there's going to be 7,000 that are left, he said, for Elijah. So where do we go? Like, what's the tools? We find ourselves in this place of this fear, depression. You know, God, Elijah turned away from everybody else. So where do we turn to? Well, we know God and his word. Luckily, we have the canon of scripture. And a lot of times we'll say, well, God's not speaking to me honestly, so there's no hope. I just, God gave us thousands of his words on a book that we can have. And it's like, it's on our phones. <laughs> We're like, I don't read my Bible every day. And I'm like, uh, how have you not? You know, how do you, how do you not? Like, look at it, right? It's like, my Bible's too hard to it's put in the car and it gets stuck there, and, but it can go with us. Like, you can just push a button on your phone, you can start listening to it, and just have the word, like, permeate our hearts. But Elijah was waiting there, he was waiting for the miraculous work, and God spoke to him in that low voice. So where do we go? We got God's word, we've also got, yeah. <laughs> we've also got friends, family, church support to encourage us to be reminded of the truth sometimes. Have you ever needed to be reminded? You're like, God, it's really bad. And he's like, I mean, it's not really that bad, right? Or or maybe we just need our perspective turned, right? Maybe we just need somebody to say, hey, you know what? I understand where you're coming from, but here's what God's still doing, right? Maybe sometimes we just need those reminders, and God certainly did that for Elijah. We have so many things going for us, don't we? Maybe we just need to start the conversation. Maybe you're just not sure how, what that even looks like. I know this is a hard season for um, the world and for the church, trying to figure out how do we navigate this, how do we, um, how do we even say like I'm not okay? Sometimes I don't even know how to say it, right? So, I want you to take a look at the screens for a moment. Um, this is a part of the uh, four-part installment of um, a, a widow who who lost a, a guy who I knew went to school with. His name's Eric, and um, she shared just about how the church should handle that, how should we should interact with the kids. Saw it at camp. And so this will be the third video. She kind of talks about what the perspective of the church should be. How do we start the conversation? Go ahead, take a look. How do we address these issues? Um, the church needs to be on the front lines. Uh, we are the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. And we are the ones that are supposed to be a refuge and a safe place for people who are struggling with these things and battling them. And um, I think the very first thing is having the conversation. Being brave enough to talk about it and and always I always say let's start this conversation and as ministry leaders start the conversation be bold to be the one to step out in faith and trust that God is going to use it um, not only in your life but in the lives of others so whoever watches this um, and whatever age you are start the conversation make it an important conversation because people people are lost people are scared um are taking their life because they don't know where else to turn and they think that's the only way and that is not the only way and the church has the opportunity to say okay we may not know everything about mental illness but we know the God who does and we're willing to learn about it and and so I think that needs to start with us as believers if it's us that that's struggling personally step out in faith talk about it share your story I say, um, you know, there's, when we are vulnerable, mm. we don't let shame identify us anymore. Right. We actually embrace such an amazing character of God, and that is compassion mm. and love and, and saying, okay, yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I struggle with these things, but God, but God is big enough to take them and, and, and to heal it and to, to use our brokenness, our broken stories uh, to bring about glory and power and healing into others' lives. So yes, the church needs to talk about it. Another thing I would say is the ministry of presence. Um, a lot of times it's not that we want to be mean, it's, it's that we don't know how to help someone struggling with this. And so in that case, just being there and, and Eric always said, ask questions, don't make comments. Just being there and asking the questions of, I don't understand this. Help me understand what you're going through. And, and that ministry of presence is so powerful, that community uh, of just saying, I love you and I accept you no matter what you tell me, no matter what you're, you're dealing with. Um, and, and as believers, I think that's important for us to just admit when we don't know, but also educate ourselves to say, I don't know, but I want to know. 
And scripture, scripture, like I said, talks about all, all these people, our biblical heroes who struggle with these things. And I think we can go to scripture for encouragement, but I think God also provides us with resources. And, and if your pastor doesn't know or your mentor doesn't know how to handle these things, God gives us Christian counselors and different resources that we, we can go to. We just need to be brave and start the conversation and share our story. The mountaintop to the base. We all experience those uh, spaces in life, and uh, from somebody who experienced it to its nth degree, losing a husband, um, gives us some perspective. And so today, well, how do we come to this place of deliverance? Maybe you're struggling now. We'll talk to somebody, maybe it's a spouse or a friend or family member. Uh, maybe you need to get a little more help. Pastor Christian counseling, like she mentions. Uh, maybe you just need to stay consistent with something, reaching out. Uh, not being left alone and to ourselves. We really should be able to answer the question of how many people are there in your life that you can go and tell whatever's going on right now. And that might be a short list, but it should be at least a few people, right? So maybe we've heard all this today. You've heard this for the first time, but Elijah was bold. He was used. He got scared, like most of us do. We've all been scared before. And Elijah, what happened for him? Well, he was preserved by God. He reached out to God in a low whisper. That's where he gave him the rest of his purpose and direction. For his life, but maybe you're here today and you, you, know, you see this and you're like, yeah, I've been in despair before, but I don't know what it's like to have hope for life. But what we believe is if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, then you can have that hope. You can have eternal life, which guarantees us a place in heaven when we die. No matter what else happens here, the Bible tells us that we can have that hope, no matter what's going on. And so if that's you, maybe you want to reach out online. I'd be glad to connect with you that way. If you're here in person, then I'd like to talk to you in person if that is you. I want to close uh, with us uh, in prayer. You know, there's um, more hopeful days in the future, more happy topics and things to enjoy and talk about. Uh, but this is just a season for us. I know the Lord was pressing on me just to, um, to share. Is it always fun? No, not necessarily. But it's certainly the difficult things that it seems like when we deal with, and God can bring so much more joy in life. And when we come to those seasons, we can go, okay, God, I understand. Now I know what I need to do, like God told Elijah. And so maybe you're looking for that answer today. I'd love to help you with that. Let me pray for you, okay? Father, we thank you for uh, today, uh, for your word, um, for amazing people in the Bible who you know, at times we feel like we're nothing like and we, uh, we can't connect with. Um, we're thankful that even those people um, lost hope. Those people even despaired at times. Even those who were boldly used, God, um, they got scared. And so I gotta just pray that when we feel like we're in these places where we are, and we feel like we can't get out. Uh, I pray that this would be our perspective, that we know that it's okay not to be okay. Um, we are fragile human beings that um, need your help daily, and we need each other. And so I just pray that whatever that looks like in somebody's life today, in the coming weeks, uh, they would just share where they're at. Maybe they're just stuck in this place of uh, being scared, of being in despair because of it. I pray that like Elijah, Maybe we wouldn't see mountains crumble and uh, fire and um, a great wind. God, but I pray that if anything, like you spoke to Elijah, that we would hear uh, that faint whisper, um, instruction from you that gives us purpose in life and everything else. I thank you that you're always with us and you encourage us, whether we're on the mountaintop or we're on the base, in a place of despair or great joy. And thank you that you walk with us. Uh, through the midst of uh, all of it. And uh, it's in your name we pray.